to another episode of Inside the Recording Studio. I am Jody Whitesides, and with me, as always, is Mr. Chris Halstrom. How are you today, Chris? Doing good, man. How are you doing, Jody? I had an awesome morning of epic snow skiing where the powder was thigh to waist deep in some places. It was pretty nice. Yeah. And what did I tell you when you texted me? Don't rub it in. <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> shut the hell up, man. Yeah, let's move on. <laughs> right. What are we talking about today then? Well, we're going to discuss a, a topic that I'm sure we're going to get possibly a fair bit of blowback on. Um, the um, hardware versus software synths. Yes. This can be contentious, and I think it's a little bit contentious in the same way that physical guitar amps versus amp sims. Silly, silly, silly. I think so too. I think it's a non-issue, <laughs> but we're going to discuss and give our thoughts on it and pros and cons of both, I suppose. And then dear listeners can make up their minds and then yell at us and go like, no, you're <laughs> You're so wrong. Idiot. <laughs> yeah, you're an idiot, Chris. Why would you do that? Just a comparison against amp sims, I think is an apt one because just like amp sims do for guitar, they sound really, really good today. Yes, they do. And so do, in my opinion, soft synths. There was a time where you had a valid argument that they just didn't come close to the hardware synths of, of the time or even older ones, right? Where the sound just wasn't there. But do you today, think that's I a processing power issue that they've probably. gotten over now that we have pretty powerful computers? Yeah, I would say so. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think everything from the processing power and also the emulation technology of things that, that people are dealing with. Like It's kind of like when we discussed that how with a vocal mic, say, yeah, this is the EQ curve on my 57 that's <laughs> used right. something else, right? Just, it's so much more to it than that. Yeah, I, I think it's fair to say that it's one of horsepower in, in the machines available today. Sure. I think it's probably fair to say that between the two of us, while we both use soft synths in the music that we tend to do, I might be a little bit more of the tinkerer than to you with, with software synths. Is that a fair assessment or, or am I kind of backing you up against the corner by saying that? <laughs> no, I think it's a fair assessment. I have the desire to tinker, but sure. I generally don't usually have the time to tinker. That's the difference, I think. Yeah, of course. I mean, there's so many things that we can spend our time in getting better on. It's just that up to this point, because I actually studied some of this stuff actually way back in the day. where You went to school for this. I did for a little bit. I took about six months at MI and actually did some of this. We studied actually, you know, the beginnings of basic sampling on the Akai's and things and mm, how, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but just like how oscillators worked and all this kind of stuff. And then it's the first time ever, you know, somebody told me that, yeah, you actually have to tune a mini Moog. Like, right. Tune a synth? What What are you talking about? <laughs> but, this but isn't a fish. Do, right. So, but, but I am, I mean, I'm not as good as I would like to be. Again, it's just a time thing, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not my primary instrument too, but I can get where I want to. That's how I look at it. And while I have made attempts in the past to get into synth tutorials about mm -hmm. doing things, I usually tend to get a little bit bored real fast for it for some reason. You could put a guitar amp sim in front of me and I can twiddle with that for days. You do the same thing with a synth and for some <laughs> reason I can't. But it's not to say that I don't twiddle with knobs with synths especially plug-in versions, giving it away, hint, hint, that I right. tend to use soft sense to tweak the sounds that I come across. And I have yet to really build a superior library of synths of my own sounds, so to speak. I take pre-done sounds that are close, and then I tweak them a little bit further. I guess it makes me lazy, but at the same time, if I had the same passionate desire for soft sense as I do with guitar amps, I'd probably think different. Yeah, but you're in pretty good company as we'll discover towards the end of, of today's episode where somebody else that does that, that definitely has the ability oh, to, of course. to not. Yeah, I think it's one of those things that if you know your way around, now this is not, this sounds like we're gonna talk about how to tweak sounds and stuff, we're not, but 
knowing your way around and getting what you want out of a synth is ideal. Just mm-hmm. kind of like knowing what stuff does. Yes. And that's where you have a good head start compared to me. Yeah. I don't know. It probably was in my industrial days in the 90s that <laughs> I started diving into it a little bit more, as mm-hmm. it were, because I wanted to understand it. But sure. Like 45,000 miles behind somebody like Venus Theory or something like that <laughs> who can do that a lot better than I do. But I do find it interesting. I'm with you when you start watching tutorials and things. It's either, okay, here's an oscillator and you change the sound wave like this, the very basics, and then it just jumps to... PhD. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Right? So it's like, ooh, th- there's a whole chunk there that I must have missed, you know? Yes. So let's dive into this in terms of talking about it rather than reminiscing on our lack of education about it or mine, <laughs> not so much there, yours. I agree. There's two big camps in terms of this, and it's not just hardware versus software. The first thing that I thinking about two camps here, I'm definitely thinking of soft synths. Okay. And I'm thinking of the first camp, which is the emulation or recreation of classic hardware synths. Okay, that makes good sense. And I think that's, you know, not necessarily the biggest leap that has happened, but that process has become a lot better. So there's a lot of great sounding emulation soft synths available today, Mm -hmm. right? There's the Yuhi stuff with Diva and two that I own, the, the Repro 1 and 5. But then we have, like, from SoftTube, they have their Model 84 and the Model 72, which is the, I think it, it's the Juno 106 and the Mini Moog. Okay. Um, and, of course, there's the native instrument stuff. They have their Monarch, right. which is a recreation of the Mini Moog again. And that's a favorite, from what I understand, of Jean-Michel Jarre. French composer. So if he likes it, it, it's probably good enough for anybody. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) You have a rolling cloud as well. So you got all of that stuff. I have the entire ultimate of rolling clouds. So I have access to everything they do there. And it's kind of crazy. To me, if you're going to go after a recreation of one of Roland's classic hardware synths, what better way to do it than to actually have it from rolling cloud? Right. Because you're getting it straight from the people that built the darn thing in the first place. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I don't have it. I have more sense that I need probably. Well, here's the crazy thing. Yeah. I had the – I'm going to jump on this because I don't even recall the actual model number of the Roland that I had. Part of the 1080 line. And I actually pulled out some old four-track demos from that era where I had Simpty code on the thing and I was tying it along with this synth and it would play back sounds from that synth. I no longer have that synth, even though I used it for many years as a controller. I've replaced it with a much more modern controller, the S88 from Native Instruments. In order to actually play back those sounds, I had to go find them in the Roland Cloud. And it was crazy because they actually do have all of those sounds from that very low key synthesizer. Well, in good their thing that you, you kept the patch names and stuff, right? Yes. So, yeah. It took me a while to find them all in there because it's part of a classic recreation thing that they did in Roland Cloud. So, yes, if you're going to go with the Roland stuff, I highly recommend Roland Cloud because it's all there and then yeah. some because they do have well, some that's... new ones that are rather cool. Yeah. So obviously there's a lot of these like emulations and stuff around today. And then most of them I would say are are really good. Mm -hmm. Now, somebody that has an old mini Moog might argue that point. There, I stand by it. I think (laughs) most of them are really good. Now, the other category as far as like soft sense are concerned to me is when you kind of let go of the emulation or recreation of classic Mm synths and think about more modern offerings as well that tend to be possibly more flexible and perhaps more forward thinking. I think I said that. I think that's the best way I can think about it, where in music production today, we have the capability of doing so much more sure. than was just available in classic sense. Just the horsepower. So what do they do? There. What do they do that's well, different? Well, the way that I look at things seems like a simple thing, but the ability to load samples and then process the crap out of that 
the time stretching, all this kind of stuff, but just doing that, how everything and its uncle, every parameter pretty much can get modulated, mm -hmm. right, by another source. Well, I'm asking more about like things like granular synthesis. You're going off on oh, okay. the word yeah, salad here. <laughs> yeah. Well, but that would be one thing, right? Where you mm -hmm. can do that spectral synthesis, all this type of stuff that's available today and how you can make sound that is not necessarily trying to sound like a mini Moog. Now, do you think it's, there was a scientist at some point that thought, hmm, photosynthesis, let's turn that into something that synthesizers can do? Because you can actually uh, take photographs and stick them into a synth and have it yeah. do some crazy stuff to a sound just based right. on the nature of the photograph. And of course, I'm making the joke in relation to the fact that photosynthesis is normally how plants operate. <laughs> when you're saying everything has the ability to be modulated, we're looking at things like X for records. How do you, is that transfer X for? How, that, that, I think it's X for records. It's yeah. serum. Yeah. Okay. But even thing, I mean, it's not just them, but serum is obviously a big popular synth today where mm -hmm. a lot of people use. One that I like is actually a free synth as well. It's called Vital from Vital Audio. Now they have add-on banks and things like that and add-on wavetables. And if you really like it, I'd obviously do that, buy that. But here are things where it's not trying to recreate something else. It's trying to create something new. So I think that's a big strength to being in the box as it were. Sure. When you have that option, mm -hmm. right? And probably throw in Iris, What's well, two now, I think, and I might even have been discontinued, but from uh, Isotope. That was that a pretty think, crazy synth. Yeah, it, I think it was interesting in the way that how you could tweak, because it worked in a similar way that you could treat the samples. Like if you're familiar with RX, how you could either erase parts of the frequency spectrum or, you know. Select certain loop, portions, loop certain right. portions. And it was very visual in that regard. Right. Probably right. why they call it the iris. You know what? I think you might have a point. There. I don't know. <laughs> have to ask them. The whole reactor series from Native Instruments is also, you know, is there anything there that you, you can't do? Now, I think from some of these, especially reactor, and it's probably better today, but the initial versions of reactor can seem really, really daunting because there isn't a pretty GUI to look at. Right, no. so it, it's a lot of parameters and, and very basic appearance. So I think that can turn some people, but the most enthusiastic tweakers get turned off by that. And speaking of getting turned off, let's take a word from our sponsors. And we're back. We're gonna dive into some other differences here of the versus of software versus hardware. What's the first thing we're thinking about here, Chris? Well, I, I suppose we should talk about the added functionality that a lot of times software allows us. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that there's a limited functionality of hardware, but it is not going to be, in most cases, as flexible as what we afforded in, in software. If you're of that mentality that you want to tweak, you can... Obviously, do a lot of tweaking with hardware since, but if you want to go really esoteric, software is the way to go with that. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about these things with emulations and stuff, I think it's important to kind of bring up that, at least from my point of view, I'm talking about classic hardware synths, mm -hmm. like the Mini Moog or like the Profits or any of like the Oberheim type of thing, the Roland stuff. It's not that there aren't modern synths out there and even the recreations now that come out from Roland in hardware form, they have much more muscle power mm -hmm. than the, the original versions. That, that kind of goes without saying. I still think the difference there between software and hardware, especially when you consider the cost difference between them, right? What, right. What's the best way to go? You brought up some other things though here before we started the tactile feel of course with tweaking things yes right? it's a very very different thing if you have your hands on and you're turning knobs and faders that feels much different than sitting and mousing around and can certainly be more inspiring to do moves in real time if you think of a hardware unit for that purpose great that's awesome but doesn't mean that we can't do that with software since that doesn't. 
No. And I, another difference that I'm thinking about right now, and this would be another reason for why there would be people out there would think, no, oh, hardware synths, man, are the shit. And it has a lot to do with a lot of early synths were subject to the power that they received. Their oscillators and other things varied based on the amount of power that was coming to the unit. So they weren't locked into a perfect sound because it would vary based on how much power was coming through your power plug outlet is a good way of <laughs> saying it. Hardware sense can be subject to power issues. Now, modern hardware sense probably aren't subject to that like they were back in the day. And software sense, if they're going for that recreation, they have to model that. And it's not necessary that it's going to be as simple to vary the sound like that. Yeah, I think it is a little bit dependent on the unit and what is floating and not. And sometimes it's parts drifting, oscillators drifting or whatever, where that could be part of the charm. Mm -hmm. But it could also be part of something that you really want to get rid of. Sure. Right. So it, consistency it's that, can be a big thing. Absolutely. So you're dealing with that. And sometimes, like I said, that's part of the charm, but sometimes it isn't. So that's something that with older hardware that you have to deal with. Otherwise, also with the tactile thing there, obviously with for using software sense, any MIDI controller can handle that. And if you have well, you know, that's that, actually that's it. not a hundred percent true. Not any MIDI controller. Well, modern MIDI controllers, because there were well, MIDI controllers. Broad strokes here. Yes. Yeah. So my point being is that I had an old Roland keyboard that we were talking about earlier. I used that for a lot of years as my controller, but upgrading to the S88 gave me a whole new world of options that that old Roland did not have. Sure, but that was also not manufactured as. A oh, no, no, MIDI no, controller. it definitely wasn't. <laughs> no, but th that's what I'm saying, right? right? So I any MIDI controller, you have the ability to assign MIDI, even if it's limited functionalities and you only have a few knobs or a few sliders, you can assign those to whatever parameters you want to be able to adjust in real time in your software. Right. So you can still get that tactile feel where you can, yeah, I'm, I'm holding down the cord, but I'm also changing the... Filter cut off. Woo Never been done before. <laughs> but you know what I mean? So it's like you can have that sensation. It might not feel exactly the same that you would on an old Moog or whatever. Right. But you can still get that hands-on and sort of get dirty, down and dirty as it were. you saying, you know, with them drifting in parts and things brings up another point where I think if you need to consider, if you're doing live use, right, mm -hmm. are you using hardware or software. And I'm not talking about software running in the background off of backing tracks, right? But now right. if you're triggering stuff on stage, I'm reminded a good friend of mine used to work for David Page of Toto. Right. And I can't remember actually what tour it was, but I remember going to see him at the show and all the piano sounds and a lot of the synth sounds that David was triggering was coming off a of main stage in Logic. And I know that because my buddy was the one that programmed it. So <laughs> it's not just like smaller, newer bands that this happens with. It is a uh, convenient thing for other acts as well, right? And here's David Page, he can have whatever the hell he wants on stage, right? Sure. But it comes, becomes one of practicality. I mean, they're great synths that are designed just for live use, obviously, for flexibility, like the Nord stuff are just really, really cool. All that kind of stuff. Well, and another major keyboard guy that we actually need to get on the podcast at some point in the not-so-distant future is David Rosenthal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's been the right-hand guy for a lot of people, and especially Billy Joel for a number of years. He uses MainStage and SoftSense now for everything. There you go. You know, if you're the type of performer, like I'm sure David has an arsenal of, of synths that would be second to none, right, of, oh, yeah. of classic stuff. But it's maintaining those bad boys as well. They will break down. It's, it's components, and you're going to need them serviced. And do you want them 
to be serviced the day of your show at Madison Square Garden with Billy Joel? Probably not, <laughs> no. because and, it's probably not going to happen. And just to kind of clarify on his setup that he has now where they take it wherever they go, it's a dual Mac Pro setup running main stage with a switching system that if one freezes, he has a switch that he can immediately flip it to the other one and it's playing at exactly the same time. So he can flip right. and it's never down. And then if the one that's freezing, his tech gets that computer restarted so that it can be back up and, and running without there being much of a glitch or a stop in the show. Plus the other thing is, is that he has to have every single sound that Billy's ever done across his entire career <laughs> and they have to be ready to play any song at any given moment because there is no set list it's just whatever the whim of billy is at any moment so That's they have crazy. to be able to dial it up immediately and be ready to play whatever song it is and have the correct sounds which is why he goes with a, a software situation like that it's just yeah practicality you just can't do it any other way yeah. Yeah, we're gonna play this song. Okay, just give me five minutes. I just need <laughs> to reprogram. You know, every, right? <laughs> yeah. So, is it cool to say that you have? Yeah, I have an old Juno or an old Jupiter. It's like, yeah, absolutely. But well, it's um, like Mike Green. You went to go see his place, and he yeah. has a ton of classic synths there. Does he play through them all? No. <laughs> No, no, he doesn't. And he actually told me that there's a place here in LA that repairs all classic you know, synths and things. Mm -hmm. And they're so backlogged that sometimes they don't accept Repairs. synths from people. Right. right. Because they simply don't have a place to store them. Mm -hmm. So that's something that you're facing now. And I mean, I don't know how many people are comfortable enough to, to dive in and actually physically repair those things. That's I don't a good know question. If it's a, don't know. Yeah. It's a dying breed. I know it's the same thing with tube amps and guitars, but we're not talking that today. Yeah, I think, that, but I think the parallels are there, right? So it's something to, to think about. What about in the studio, though? And this is a point that I wanted to bring up with another ex guest here okay. on the show as well. Mm -hmm. In the studio, here it's a little bit less volatile, I suppose. So if you have a hardware synth that you like and you like the sound of and it's in good working order, knock yourself out. Yeah. You know, absolutely do that. It, I mean, it's fun. Just like you mentioned sitting with guitar amps and tweaking sounds. Mm -hmm. When you have a hardware unit and you're not just patch surfing, you are kind of coming up with something or certainly have the ability to come up with something unique. Sure. Just because you're not just pulling up, oh, this is preset number five. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, there are a lot of those on classic records where you can hear the same synth pattern. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is this and this is this. But that's not what I'm talking about. There. So if you sit around and you're creating your own sounds, that's fantastic. And you can do that. Another thing to take into consideration as well is speed, speed of working. If speed is not an option, go ahead and experiment. And the same thing could be said for soft synths, right? You just sit there and tweak your patches. I would argue that that time is probably better spent at another time when you're not in the writing moment. Or right. in the recording moment, for that matter. Definitely then, yes. The person that I wanted to bring up there was, was C.J. Vanston, mm. right? Where, where yes. here's a guy that, again, he has a lot of classic synths, right? Oh, yeah. And You've not can, been to his studio, have you? I have not. Okay. No. Yeah. No, it is chock full of... <laughs> Classic right. It, and here's a guy that could probably whip up a patch really, really quickly. Well, it's not but even he, that he could. He does because that's how he got a lot of his gigs. Right. But I'm saying when he <laughs> was recording, yes. he said a lot of times he leans on software synths for the speed of just like pulling up your preset and getting working. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah. That to me is very telling. It speaks volumes, I think. Yes, because here's a guy that does all this for a living and has for a very long time, very successfully also, I might add. Yes. <laughs> but here's a guy that, that is leaning on software synths just for the flexibility and the speed. And he would not do that if they didn't sound really, really good. Of course. I don't know if that leads us to a verdict here. It does for me. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think everybody will make up their own mind, of course, what, what's right for everybody. But oh, you're um, so much like the politician. <laughs> well, yeah, I know. 
it's just everything isn't right for everyone. No, you know? it isn't. It, it, so, but for but, me, it's a soft synth world. Yeah. I mean, I'm there with you. And for no other reason that, of course, they sound good, but also the cost, man. Mm-hmm. And on the final note, I would just want to ask you, this is seeming sort of non sequitur, but it's about, you know, the subject, I guess. With soft sense now seeming to move away, at least to me, from just recreations of classic synths, Mm -hmm. do you think that all those recreations that we hear tie the music to a certain type of sound and therefore a certain type of music? I'm going to say that is highly dependent upon the songwriter and the producer involved. Yeah. Because I think you can do some really crazy stuff with old school sounds, not necessarily in a good way, not necessarily in a bad way. I find it's easier to get something more unique with the more modern vibe of soft synth. But that's just me. No, I agree with you there because I was doing something really, really nerdy because I had, you know, a little bit of downtime here. And this is something that I actually do, which probably speaks volumes about me. But <laughs> with, with soft synths that you get, you have extensive list of, of presets that come with it, sure. right? Yep. So one thing that I tend to do is I go through the presets and actually make note of the ones that I deem usable mm-hmm. and I save those. So when I go in and pull up presets, I'm not preset surfing through 5,000 presets. I have now a folder called bases or pads or leads or whatever they happen to be. Mm. So I know that anything in that folder is going to be something that I thought this I can use. Gotcha. Actually, that would be smart for me to do. I don't do that. But then I don't try to do a lot of patch surfing either. That's my cross and I'm, I, I'll die on it, I suppose. Yeah. All right. With that <laughs> bearing in mind, let's move on to our Friday finds. Chris, what have you got this week? I asked you before we started recording, did you ever have an ADA, the guitar amp? The answer to that is yes, I did have an ADA MP1. So did I. Didn't everybody uh, in the 80s? (laughs) Well, that was my first rack mountable preamp, and I had that for quite a while. But the reason I'm bringing that up is like Nimbrini now have a plug-in version of it, the MP1. Those sly bastards. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of fun. It was like if you want to go back and... and there so were a lot of count. metal guys that played through that. Right, because it was programmable. It was. And that was the, the selling point, and it sounded pretty good. And it did have tubes, so it had good distortion for the time. So in the emulation, they've added a power amp stage to it. So in other words, it's amp- beyond the ADA MP1 then. It's almost like the software can do more stuff than the actual hardware. Damn right? them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I thought that was kind of cool. It's like, ah, nobody's done that, at least to my knowledge. So, But there's one. That's my, my find for this Friday, the Nembrini MP1. If you want that sound, go check it out. All right. Well, what's your Friday find this week? I'm going with something coming out of Spitfire Audio's camp. Ooh, like they, Spitfire Audio. Yes. They have decided to give away a gorgeous Grand Piano VI, known as the Autographed Grand. It is a Yamaha C6 Grand, and it is Mm -hmm. free for those of you who need a nice piano sound. And it is in their Labs series of VI. Cool. It is yeah. the autograph grant. That's what I'm going with this week. While we've got your attention, we ask that you go to inside the recording studio.com and sign up for our mailing list. Doing so will get you weekly reminders about the Tuesday tips when they come out. And we'll make sure you don't miss any future episodes of this awesome podcast. Send us an email at gold star G O L D S T A R at inside the recording studio.com with the word synths S Y N T H S. And you'll get something cool back in your inbox. If you have a topic or suggestion for Chris and I to explain in a future episode, contact us at the contact page and we'll put it into consideration for a future episode. With that, I'll say see you next week. Thanks for listening, people. I'll talk to you later, Jody. Jody.